Yeah, this is Hawaii, the state of clean energy, <clears throat> organized and, uh, and created and uh, continued by Hawaii Energy Policy Forum for hmm, probably close to 10 years now. Um, and uh, Mitch Ewan, uh, who is the regular host, my co-host today, is here with us. And uh, uh, Shannon Tanganon of Hawaiian Electric is here. And Mark Glick is here from HNEI. Uh, but Mitch, uh, can you give these guys a, a proper introduction so we know more about who they are? We're going to talk about Hawaiian Electric. Uh, we're going to talk about HNEI both. You pretty well stole all my script with, with your opening there, Jay. Not, what a go. Anyway, I'm pleased to welcome uh, Shannon Tangana, Ta uh, uh, Tanganan. She's a spokesperson for Hawaiian Electric, and she's going to give us the latest uh, hot news from Hawaiian Electric. And we also have one of my colleagues from HNEI, Mark Click, who's the uh, HNEI Energy Policy Specialist, and he's going to talk to us and give us an update on what the heck is going on with the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, which is the sponsor, uh, correction, a underwriter for our show today. So Thank you, Shannon and Mark, welcome to the show. And Shannon, let's start with you. And so what is hot at Hawaiian Electric? Well, thanks, Mitch, and thanks for having us. Um, really, we just announced a really big um, initiative. And we announced last Friday that we are cutting carbon emissions from power generation 70% by 2030. And we're not stopping there. Um, we also pledged um, zero or net zero emissions by 2045. Wow, that's pretty aggressive. And uh, it's good to have those stretch goals because you never know, you, you might actually be able to beat them. Yeah, they're definitely stretch goals, but you know we think that bold action needs to be taken um, if we really want to address um, the effects of climate change. So, you know, there's a lot that goes into this. You know, right. we have to add generation, we have to retire coal. Um, you know, we have to retire another six uh, generating units from our power generation. So there's, there's so many factors and the commitment really is to keep these projects on track, you know, to do our best to get all these new, um, new generation online um, and in a timely fashion because AES is um, going to be retired in September of 2022. So we need to prepare for that, um, for that and beyond. Mm. So I have some questions about this. When you say 70%, it's a 70% reduction from what was going on in the year 2005, which is 16 years ago. Um, yeah. So we are already on the continuum from 2005 to 2030, which is eight years from now. Where are we? Because yeah. we've finished two thirds of that period already. Um, and yeah. if I divide 70% by two thirds, I get uh, something 55% already done. Is that true? No, <laughs> we are at 24%. We were at 24% at the end of 2020. So we do have a ways to go. We have 46 more, 46% uh, more um, reduction needed. So the and speed, the speed of, um, you know, going, going clean energy would now have to increase dramatically uh, to actually make up between now and the 2030 deadline at 70%. Yes, definitely. I mean, we need to act now. We need to act during this decade. So um, really, you know, all the renewable energy projects that are um, in the pipeline, those need to come online. We have to um, put out more RFPs. Um, we've already done one for a stage three for Hawaii Island. Um, that's recent. We've done that recently. So there's just, we just need to keep going um, and making sure that we're on track to meet these goals. I mean, this is going to take a lot of work. Well, um, it, it but... certainly is, and it's going to be obstacles too. Uh, let me go through the list that was in the newspaper about this of the things you're going to do. Uh, one, you're going to shut down the, the state's uh, last coal plant in 2022, September, you said. Actually, there's a statute adopted by the legislature a couple of years ago that requires that. So that really absolutely has to happen. Um, but the discussion has been with the PUC um, that whether you will have enough 
other energy to replace what's what has been coming out of the uh, you know a what is it AES coal plant um, to you know to to keep on lighting the lights. Um, and, There's no uh, question going, we'll have enough generation. There's where is that no going to come from, Shannon? Yeah. Um, renewable energy. Um, we also have coming online um, the KES, Kapolei uh, Energy Storage. So, and then we have dozen, more than a dozen of um, renewable energy projects that we have coming online. Um, it's not going to be tomorrow, but it's definitely in the works and we're working toward getting all those online in a timely fashion. You know, some of the projects have even committed to an earlier, um, you know, earlier deadlines or coming on even earlier than they had initiate, mm -hmm. um, initially said. So, you know, all that is in the works. Um, well, and actually, we want to add another 50,000 uh, rooftop solar systems to the 90,000 that we already have. I want to ask you about that. <clears throat> we have, we have uh, what, 90,000 now rooftop solar in, in the operating area for Hawaiian Electric. <clears throat> and you guys uh, want to do 50,000 more. That's, uh, that's, you know, half again as much. Uh, and my question to you is, uh, how, how can you control those 50,000? Because that's really not within your ability to control, is it? How does Hawaiian Electric achieve the, the next 50,000 in the next eight years? We really need to make the process easier. Um, I think sometimes uh, in the past, people have gotten a little discouraged by the length of time it takes. So we've introduced different programs, um, Quick Connect. Um, now we have battery bonus. So there's incentive, um, you know, cash incentive for battery bonus. And, you know, just in general, wanting to do the right thing, you know, putting rooftop solar on your home if you're able. So with all that in the works, with all these programs that make it quicker to get your um, system online, you know, these are, everything's going to be speeding up in this, this, this decade. So as we one get of the things that's, that has been involved in the legislature for the past three years um, has been a bill that would allow for tax credit on adding storage to an existing mm, solar facility on a rooftop. And the ledge has not seen fit to pass that bill yet. And to me, that would be a very important incentive because um, it, it incentivized solar in general um, to have the tax credit on existing facilities. Uh, so the, does the plan, I mean, such as it is, the, the Hawaiian Electric plan, uh, include trying to get that bill passed? Because that would be meaningful in achieving the next 50,000 um, uh, rooftop solar systems. No? You know, I would have to check with our government relations um, staff, but I think in general, we support initiatives that would speed the um, you know adoption of rooftop solar of storage so you know we're always you know keeping track of those kinds of measures um, we definitely want to see more we have to see more if we want to reach these goals so you know we'll, we're going to do whatever we can in our power to get all these projects online and make make it easier and quicker um, to get these uh, systems online. Okay. So, the so newspaper a, also reported that you were going to retire at least six fossil fuel generating units uh, and reduce uh, the use of others, I suppose. Um, can you give me a time frame on that? Because eight years is not a long time. And uh, as, you, as you take them offline, th these would be oil, I guess. Uh, as you take them offline, you're going to have to have the renewables to replace them. So what does that look like? You know, we don't have a set timetable. We do know that renewables are going to be coming online, you know, whether it be, you know, two years from now, three years from now. As those come online, then we're going to be able to retire some of these units. Um, so it really is, just, you know, it's always been a, a balancing act, right? We just need to make sure that we have reliable power um, for our customers. So, 
it's it's just a it'll be a long process um but the goal is 70 percent reduction by 2030 and we're, we're sticking to that we you know we want to take bold action now um so that we can have a better future or create a better future for our children and grandchildren but you have to deal with issues I mean, for example, um, uh, I read about, uh, just when I was preparing for the show, but I read about the NG. It's a French company, uh, supposed to do what? Uh, solar, I think, a big solar yeah. facility on the big island, and they pulled out. Um, and uh, then there's a, another, uh, what is it, KES, I think, uh, they're also pulling out of their project. Um, so oh, you, is not pulling out of their project. No, there was another one. I, I don't remember. Mitch, do you remember which one? No, um, the, the, anyway, uh, there's another one. I can't remember the uh, name of it. Um, and so um, what, we, what you have is, uh, 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 I want to call it a marketplace that is not entirely predictable. And one thing and another, you know, uh, outside of the utilities ability to control these things, uh, and, you know, it's like one step forward and what happens now? <laughs> so yeah. it, may, it may not be easy. And if you want to push forward in the eight years remaining on this, you know, this, this initiative, um, you know, it's not, it's not always going to be as you predict. I mean, are you factoring that in? Yeah, I mean, we definitely have factored, you know, projects dropping out, um, new projects coming in. So, again, it is unpredictable, but, you know, we're doing all we can to make sure that there's a, a good pipeline of projects, you know, in the mix um, and, and moving forward, because that's all that's really all we can do. Um, we want to make sure that we want to make sure that, you know, getting rooftop solar is not going to take forever. Um, and we've definitely addressed that. We have like Quick Connect, um, you know, programs that allow people to just really just um, put their system online, you know, kind of like the NEM days in the, you know, in the past where, you know, you just apply, you, you get your system online and then you figure out the paperwork later or, you know, all the, yeah. oh, all yeah. the other things that bureaucratic things that slow you down, those will all be taken care of at the back end. Um, it strikes me though, Shannon, that you have been like Quick Connect is not brand new. And there are a lot of um, projects out there, utility scale solar that have been, uh, you know, submitted to the PUC that are pending. Uh, there are a lot of things I mean, over the years, uh, the recent years that uh, Hawaiian Electric has been doing and attempting to do um, all, all over its operating area in order to do this. So my question to you is, what is different about this initiative, the 70% initiative, uh, than what's been going on anyway? You know, you know, that's a great question. It's really just pushing forward and just making sure we say, this is what we're going to do and stick to that. Um, it's really about moving toward that goal and just making sure that we do all we can to reach it. Um, you know, net zero by 2045, that's, you know, gonna be tough as well. Um, just gonna make sure that if we're generating more, um, you know, that we're offsetting, um, you know, it, it's a balancing act and we just need to make sure that we're taking some bold action um, that we're we're being aggressive um, as we move forward with projects. Um, that we're being um, accommodating and making sure that we're working with communities so that we don't get held up in the process. Um, you know, moving forward with a project and then you know, at the very speed end, up, speed have, up processing yeah. of connection, yeah. processing of applications, and so forth. You know, you say uh, 2045. Ultimately, I I recall. Maybe you can remind me of this, or somebody can. Um, that at one point we had the state target at 2045, but Hawaiian Electric said 2040. Um, I haven't heard that recently, but I, I do remember that that was the case. There was, um, you know, a difference uh, that the uh, the utility was more optimistic uh, than the state target. Do you recall? Yeah, I, I think in the past we have said, you know, let's try for 2040. Um, I think given all that we've seen as far as um, carbon emissions and you know all like you said some projects won't 
won't reach the very end. Um, I think what we're trying to do is, is have a stretch goal, but just be realistic about all the different factors that can, you know, can occur. All the different factors, you know, whether it be supply chain issues with, you know, our renewable projects that are going to be coming online. You know, they, a lot of them are experiencing that right now. So well, here, here's the big question, Shannon. Uh -huh. As we go down the path here, you know, the path from what, November, almost December of, of 2021 to September of 2022, when, when the uh, coal plant has to close. Um, and as we go down the path from there to 2030 with uh, all of these, uh, you know, uh, really extraordinary changes you're talking about, will you come back and talk to us about it? Cause we would like <laughs> we would like to track it through with you, Shannon. We, we want to we want to hear about all these moves, you know, going forward. Yeah. Yes, for sure. Well, I have a quick question. I want okay. to get a word in edgewise, Jay. So well, my question is, you know, this uh, 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 solar with battery storage is a really great program. So uh, my question is, what's been the appetite? For uh, rooftop owners, for you know the the private people, the, the general public, what's been the uptake? And is are they enthusiastic about that? Are they really going after this? Has this been a popular program? This is a popular program. Um, we've had um, some hiccups as far as you know, just getting everything together because it's a brand new program. Um, but, so I think we're ironing out um, some of the issues that have. Um, slowed the process a little and we're getting you know we're getting very good response um from customers i mean who doesn't want to have cash <laughs> to put up you know energy storage um so yeah it's definitely moving along um but and we're anxious to see you know where it ends up but i think it it does it will help and it will help drive up our our numbers I'd like to add something to that, Mitch. As, as we go forward in climate change, there'll be the risk of and maybe the fact of extreme weather. Okay. And um, nothing appeals to a homeowner uh, more than having independent power source just in case. And so I think a lot of people will be motivated by the ongoing threat of uh, climate change um, to get into rooftop solar. I, I think yeah, that would probably drive your numbers up, Shannon. Yeah. And maybe also plugging their electric vehicles in and uh, you know, running off the battery. Another important factor, sure. Yeah. yeah. Mark, uh, a little time for you. Do you have anything you want to ask Shannon about or add to this conversation? Well, you know, I, obviously it's, it's always good news when the utility is taking a proactive stance and moving forward aggressively on on things like greenhouse gas, you know, uh, mitigation uh, directly through its use of more renewables. I think one of the things that uh, would encourage and I wanted to ask whether or not I, I know it's early on in the in the program. You just announced it, but um, I would encourage that you uh, take a look at how you also describe it in ways that in metrics that we already understand, like the RPS. Um, so essentially. How far beyond in, at 2030 are we going to be beyond 40% uh, the requirement? Uh, it will take something more than that, I believe. So it would be really interesting and I think very positive to be able to say how far beyond uh, the statute you're, go you're going to go. Uh, so that I'd be very interested in, in uh, seeing that as this program evolves. I yeah. think if I'm not mistaken in our news release, it did say that by 2030, we'll be nearing 70%. Exciting. Tech, but Very exciting. Yeah. Hawaii is a leader. Definitely one, yeah. Okay, so sorry. this announcement, Shannon, this, this, um, this initiative, this determination to move ahead even quicker, does it have anything to do with the fact that COP26 is going on right now <laughs> in Glasgow? Not at all. Okay. <laughs> Yes, and definitely that was our, you know, that was the, uh, we wanted the timing to just be, you know, in sync with COP26. We wanted to make sure there's a focus now on climate change 
um, action plan. So we wanted to make sure that we rode that wave. And yeah, well, it's perfect had, timing, yeah. isn't it? It just yeah. happens to be everybody's really interested around the world. It's not just in Scotland, but it's, uh, you know, it's everybody talking about it. So this is perfect um, point to include in the conversation. Thank you, Shannon. We're going to move on to Mark now. Uh, thank thank you, you for coming around. I hope we see you again soon. Take care. Thank stay you. safe. Mahalo. So, Mark, um, <clears throat> thank you for coming down. Welcome to your show. Actually, it's Mitch's show, but right. but you you are um, definitely part of it as uh, the guy at HNEI who is now uh, in in the uh, Hawaii Energy Policy Forum um, position, so to speak. So, um, can you talk about uh, how things have evolved with regard to the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum and its uh, um, its its move? from the School of Social Sciences under Denise Con Conan uh, to HNEI under Rick Rochelle. Sure, I mean, that's um, really uh, a lot to talk about. And, you know, I thought it might make sense. Um, I kind of wanted to view it in terms of the past, the present and the future, uh, hopefully with a lot of focus on, on uh, where we are now and where we, where we want to head. But, you know, I think it's, always nice to remind people how the energy policy forum came about. And, you know, I, I know you've been watching it from, obviously you've had this key role for more than 10 years, but um, it, it got started back in May of 2002 uh, in the School of Social Sciences with strong support from Hawaiian Electric Company. And the original purpose, which sounds a little glib today, was to reduce Hawaii's dependence on imported oil. And this happened not coincidentally, um, right at the time um, of, well, essentially, it kind of marked the fact that from 1973, from when that major oil shock, when uh, the oil embargo uh, uh, from Arab states essentially is as a, a penalty for the Yom Kippur War in 1973, uh, essentially put an embargo on all of those that were involved in supporting Israel in that effort, uh, an embargo on oil. And that uh, was essentially the first modern oil shock. And uh, it led to a true oil crisis, but nothing significantly happened. You know, you probably recall that in every state in the nation, Congress passed laws and provided funding to set up energy offices in each of the, each of the states back in 73, 74. From that time, there was some progress in some states, but not very Are much. Are you trying progress. to remind us that you were the state energy officer for a while? You know, you didn't mention that yet, Mitch. We should talk about it now. So you, you bring a lot to the table, having occupied that role, um, not only historically, but, um, you know, in terms of the depth of knowledge about uh, the energy community. Well, yeah, I mean, there's definitely um, a heavy appreciation of that. But, you know, even before that, I was in the Office of Wine Affairs. And back in 19, uh, well, back in uh, 2002, well, 2003 is when I first uh, became involved in the Energy Policy Forum. And, you know, a key effort, there were briefings that went on then on uh, analysis and briefings on climate change and the international efforts to curb uh, greenhouse gas emissions. This is in 2002, uh, they commissioned a study on changing oil and gas supply patterns and uh, Facts Global, uh, Federer and Fesherock, who's involved in that, had experts come up with concepts and plans for regulation, taxation, and incentives. I remember I, there was a lot of activity. And in recent years, that activity has slowed down. And yeah, I so mean, it's, it's really the perfect time for HNEI to step in and, and uh, you know, revitalize the energy policy forum. But let me let me let me turn it over to Mitch, because Mitch, I'm sure, has some questions. He was there, too, just like all all of us were. Right. Yeah, well, it's been quite the like you said, uh, Mark, it's been quite an evolution. Like, um, I, I think one of the other drivers is that there was a lot of uh, aggravation, a lot of. Uh, of a conflict between all the different parties. And I think uh, one of the reasons, uh, the other reason the forum was uh, put in place back in the day was to reduce these conflicts and get everybody talking to each other rather than, you know, 
uh, putting the mattresses to the door and fighting each other and try to come to common ground and get a consensus. And I think that uh, was very successful, actually, to reduce the level of aggravation or conflict and then get people to really agree on, OK, I can live with this uh, solution. I have to give a little bit. Uh, you have to take a little bit. And, and we'll come to an agreed uh, solution and go, then go forward with a policy that, that everybody in the forum agreed to uh, that the, uh, then the legislators knew that most of the conflicts had been ironed out and it made it a lot easier to pass some uh, really good legislation. In particular, um, a, a, another big initiative was, uh, was getting adequate funding for the PUC and for the consumer advocate who had been totally underfunded and couldn't basically just couldn't do their job. And so now we have a really great PUC which is very active and, and doing good things and getting national uh, recognition and also with the DCA. So these are some of the, this is some of the legacy that we had from the policy forum. But I, I would have to say that over the last few years, that activity is basically uh, slacked off, uh, mainly because we solved a lot of the conflicts and well, so we, we, this is the perfect time, and Mark is the perfect guy to talk to about this, yeah. um, because because we're in a period of revitalization, uh, where the Energy Policy Forum uh, will take a, a more active role in terms of, um, you know, uh, advocacy is the wrong word, but raising public awareness about energy issues. Right. And so, Mark, uh, really important, uh, and we would like to hear from you about this. What What's the plan going forward? Uh, there's a new time. Uh, there's new reasons for the Energy Policy Forum to um, participate in a public sphere and within the industry itself and within the offices of the university. Uh, what 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 is going to happen? How do you see this going forward? Yeah, and no, I and that that brings it full circle. So where we are today, of course, um, you know there there have been changes, um, and when the discussion arose this summer with Rick Rochelo and Denise Conan and others about trying to keep it alive. Um, we said at HNEI that extremely important for all the reasons you just said, you know, it, 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 there does need to be a centralized place with the state in premature, you know, with the trustworthiness of the state, knowing that um, we're really looking out for the public interest. Uh, and there's no question about that. Uh, that there is somebody to be able to openly lay out uh, the analysis, to be able to bring people together, uh, to be able to ask the difficult questions, but in a very constructive, positive way. And so we decided uh, in taking this thing on and transferring all, all the activity uh, now to, within HNEI uh, to take our role as a kind of an unbiased analyst uh, to be able to try to bring a little bit more uh, science-based approach into really three areas. And one of them, and we're going to be reaching out to the membership, the past membership. We're going to be reaching out and creating new members uh, that have a, a lot of interest that were not simply part of it in the past, uh, particularly as we get into this integrated market uh, with more transportation, uh, electric vehicles, and so on. Um, one of the three areas, focus areas that uh, we want to delve deeply into is, is kind of the traditional one, the high penetration renewable analysis and planning, and essentially continuing to um, uh, make transparent the integrated grid planning process, uh, make it uh, sort of understandable for those who are not in it day to day, um, and dealing with data collection and, and hopefully re uh, recent studies some of them that we have conducted or that we've uh, commissioned at HNEI and others that we're aware of that will help answer some of the key questions. We continue to get questions from legislators all the time about, you know, what, what's the trade-offs between batteries and, and uh, different generation sources and particularly the intermittent generation stored uh, sources and how are we going to meet our targets? I think there are some very clear answers to that in recent analysis. Um, I think there's even some quite, you, there was a wonderful 
point that you raised, Jay, Jay when you asked about um, essentially you're asking about inverter based technologies and you know if you're going to have 50,000 new rooftop uh, solar installations, how are you going to manage that effectively? Well, there are some really interesting answers. I, I want to be able uh, to bring those things to the table. And uh, you could you could help Hawaiian Electric. That's your right. scientists, uh, your technology, the work you've already done, and the work you can do now to respond to the issues that they will undoubtedly, you know, have in terms of trying to meet their own goals here. Um, but let me uh, let me let me go a little further and say um, the community, in my view, needs you. Uh, the community needs that scientific analytic based uh, approach. Um, because that is a, a gathering point, um, and we will we can't possibly anticipate um, the, the contribution you could make on those issues because we don't know exactly what they are yet. We will find out. And uh, I look forward. I want to speak for myself now. I think I speak for Mitch also. I look forward to having you on the show over and over again to help us track what is going on uh, in the community. Um, in the industry, the, you know, the, the utility industry, for example, in the installation industry, and certainly in the scientific research and analysis industry um, that, that happens not only at HNEI, but in other departments at the university. I mean, think about all the sciences here. Um, mm -hmm. But we're almost out of time, Mitch. So um, can I ask you to chime in here? Uh, you can. Um, so... I think there's a, a very good um, um, a future for the policy forum. I'm glad to see that Mark is uh, in the chair and taking this leadership role. And I look forward to uh, supporting it the best way I can. Um, so we've been uh, listening to uh, Mark Glick of the Hawaii Energy uh, Policy Forum and now HNEI. And um, the other way, so, the other way it was HNEI <laughs> then the, okay. Just want to straighten well, that out. Mark is agreeing with me. Well, it's all in the eye now, so which is a good thing. So uh, that's it for my show for this uh, for this week. And uh, the uh, uh, twenty eight minutes now evolved into we're up minute uh, thirty four. So we need to sign off. And so this is Hawaii, the state of clean energy, signing off. We'll see you in one or two weeks. Aloha.